Good afternoon, Pastor Cliff 69 here with a brand new study. We're going to be going through the book of Jude um, for people in my soon to come home, uh, my new home in Lena, Illinois. Uh, the Bible study in Lena, Illinois will be using these videos, but I encourage others to use them as well. We're going to be going through the book of Jude, the book of Jude. Um, Jude is an interesting book. It's actually written by one of the younger brothers of Jesus. Now, this is hard for us to imagine, but could you imagine growing up with Jesus as your older brother? I mean, talk about difficult. You know, how often have you been compared to your siblings? Why can't you be more like whoever your sibling is? Especially if it's an older sibling. And really, honestly, could you imagine the sort of difficulty that would be being compared to an older sibling like Jesus? Um, you know, Jesus' mom might say, why can't you behave like Jesus? And what was Jude to say? Because Jesus was always perfect. Um, he couldn't sin. It was not in his nature to sin. It was in his human nature to have the ability to sin. But in the complete dual nature of Jesus, as fully God and fully man, he was unable to sin. He couldn't do it. He was always perfect all the time. And we know he was smart because when he was a, when he was a youth, he stopped to uh, to debate the uh, the 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 scholars at the temple and went back to do so so you really couldn't match your brother could you imagine the sort of anger and angst you would have growing up towards him that added to your natural sin which wants to reject everything godly and that natural sin is discussed in Romans chapter 1 verse 18 through 24 now this is something that we're going to have to struggle with here because Jude addresses it but never once mentions that he is Jesus' brother. He fails to do so. Instead, he calls himself the brother of James, uh, who was also a, a younger brother of Jesus. And we can't run away from this. This is a, a man who knew Jesus his whole life. He grew up with him in his household, yet rejected constantly. We're told that um, in the book of John that he and his brothers thought Jesus, or said, told people that Jesus was mad as he was preaching, he started to preach. He tried repeatedly with his family to stop Jesus from preaching, to dissuade him from doing it. Yet here he is, years after the death, calling himself a servant, or as we'll see later, a slave of Jesus. This is something that, uh, that we as believers today have to struggle with, because we have no way of connecting with, uh, with Jesus in the way that he did. Instead, we have to look at him the way Jude is looking at him, and use Jude as a way of seeing what our relationship is with Jesus would have to be. So why don't we start the text right now. But before we start the text, let's pray. Um, Heavenly Father, Lord God, please guide us as we go through this text, Lord, and use it to get a better understanding of who you are and what you would have us be. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. The text we're handling today is Jude chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, which reads as follows. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, beloved, of God, beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Now, this letter is uh, not addressed normally for one of this era. What you would normally do is refer to your father. So you would normally say, Jude, the son of Joseph. Or if your older brother was very famous, like Jesus was, you'd say, I am Jude, brother of Jesus, or whoever the most famous and influential person in your line older than you was. But Jude doesn't do this. <clears throat> he doesn't reference Jesus at all, except to say that he's a servant of him, and we'll learn a little bit more about that word in a while. Instead, he says, brother of James. He does not use the most influential person in his background for a reason. He's being very humble. He could have said, this is Jude, the brother of Jesus, uh, who knew him growing up, who spent my entire life with him. We had the same household. I saw him when he was young. Um, I knew how he treated his mom, his dad, his brothers, and everybody else in the household. You need to listen to me. He doesn't say that at all. Quite the opposite. He says, this is Jude, the brother of James, who frankly does the same thing. 
This is a level of humility that, that we really need to consider as we go through this. He does not take advantage of his relationship with Jesus at all. Instead, he calls himself a servant. And the word there is doulas, uh, which means doesn't mean servant in the way we would think of it. It means one who is solely committed to another, a slave or subject. That's the way that the uh, Bauer, Art, Gingrich, and Danker um, Greek English lexicon defines it. A slave. Now, this sort of slave is not like we would think of as an American slave, um, a racial slave. Instead, this is like the kind of slave who, who owes something to his master, um, who, is, who is doing either willfully or no the service of his master, but he's wholly committed to his master's cause. But he is a slave. Instead of saying, I'm the brother of Jesus, which he legitimately could have done, he said, I'm a slave of Jesus. And we really, really have to consider this humility he's showing in our time. How often do people today use titles of advantage? I'm Dr. So-and-so. I'm Pastor So-and-so. I'm Judge So-and-so. I'm a police officer. I'm a teacher. I'm a professor. Whatever it is, we always take advantage of a title. But Jude does not, even though he has a title that would instantly command the attention of every believer everywhere. Instead, he calls himself a slave. He does not take advantage of the title, but instead calls himself a slave. Such a position of obvious honor that he could claim. Such a position of advantage, and yet he does not. We really need to think about this, especially looking at who he addresses. He says, to those who are called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. So Jude is addressing a group of people that are described by two things, both called and beloved uh, of the Lord. To those called, uh, that's the Greek word kletois, it means relating to those who are called or invited, or tois kletois, to those called or, to, or invited. The people invited in, the people who, say, get invited to a dinner, or especially chosen out of a group to attend something. That's the first thing he addresses. Who is this? This is the church. The church, the Greek word that describes church is ekklesia, uh, which means a group called out assembly of people called out for a purpose. We're a group called out for a purpose, a group of people chosen by God to serve a function. And we can't avoid that name because that's what scripture calls us. This is who this is addressed to. Um, the other thing that, that he addresses, the same group of people, those who are beloved, or tois agapomenois, those who are cherished by God, those whom God has done something special for, something like dying for their sins and applying his justice to them, would be that sort of special, special thing. But Jesus did much, much more than this. And we have to remember this as we go forward. Remember, this is being written by a man who's not claiming to be a brother of Jesus for special purposes, but instead is showing great humility and writing to people and saying, you're the ones who are called by Jesus. You're the ones who he died for, who he showed his caring for, who he showed his care of, his deep care of by spending his life. This letter is addressed to believers. That means it's directly addressed to all of us not just the people there. Remember, this is a circular letter for all those who knew of who Jude was. He's addressing an issue in the church faced by many believers. He just addresses it to believers, not the believers in some city, not the believers in some area like Galatians or something like that. Instead, to believers about an issue that believers are going to face. So everything in this letter directly applies to every believer. That includes you and I. Wow. Directly applies to every single believer. But why? He's not saying he's Jesus' brother. He's just saying he's this guy Jude and he's addressing it to us. Why would this apply? Well, because it is in Scripture. And Scripture has the authority of God speaking. This is as though God appeared before you and said these words. Well, how do I know this? Well, if you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16, it says, What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, 
I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Now what's interesting here is the, the phrase, as God said. Because this is a reference to Leviticus chapter 26, verse 12, yet it refers to it as God speaking. He does the same sort of thing in Acts chapter 1, verse 16, chapter 3, 24, and 25. Scripture often, or sometimes, refers to Scripture as God speaking. The other thing it does in Romans 9, 17, is it quotes God saying something, and then says, as Scripture said. In Romans 9, 17, it does this. So, Jude is giving an instruction in an authoritative document that we know is of God. That we know is of God. It doesn't get included in Scripture unless it meets certain criteria. Now, this is not going to be a lesson in canonicity or something like that. Just remember that everything of the category of Scripture has God's breath in it. That's 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 16. And that every phrase of Scripture is guided by the Holy Spirit. That's uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21. And this is something we have to remember because, number one, this isn't just some guy named Jude yelling at us about something. This is Jude speaking as an authoritative voice from God, giving us a message. That message is important, especially considering how humble he's being. He's not saying, believe me, because I was Jesus' brother. He's not saying, believe me, because I knew him when he was growing up, and I could tell you what his favorite foods were. Instead, he's saying, this is what God is telling you to do. This is my message that comes from God. Now, <clears throat> did he know he was writing scripture? Well, we can look at the writings of Peter and Paul, and they knew they were writing scripture. They knew each other were writing scripture. They recognized when something you were writing was scripture, if you were a man authorized to write scripture. So did Paul know? Yes. Did Peter know? Yes. Did Jude know? It seems as though he did. He knew he was writing scripture. He knew these were commands as of the Lord. He knew it and took it seriously. Why? Because the Holy Spirit was superintending or watching over carefully what he wrote. Now, why is this important to us? Well, because some things later on are going to be kind of hard for us to take. But there's good news before we get to that. How he addresses us. What he wants for us. And we know that this is a humble man speaking humbly for God himself when he says, May mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. May mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. When we consider what we just learned about Scripture, that it's God speaking, this is God saying that he wants mercy, peace, and love grown or multiplied many times in your life. What a wonderful idea that God thinks of you that way, that he thinks of me that way. The God who chose you out of the whole universe to die for, he died for you. You were on his mind as he was suffering on the cross. You were on his mind as he was going through that painful, uh, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He knew you, and he wanted mercy, peace, and love grown and increased many times in your life. This is great news. This is great news that must start off the beginning of this letter. Why? Because there's going to be some difficult things here. And we have to remember it is God speaking. And we speak these, these hard things later. These things at the beginning that we know God wants for us. Because this is scripture. And Judas speaking as an authorized representative of God. Speaking God's words to us. This is what God wants for us. Judas is going to give us a very deep reason for doing what he said. Because God wants mercy, peace, and love for us. Now, as I said, he's going to go very deeply into things. And as he does, we have to remember the deep humility that the Lord's brother is, is expressing in this letter. He didn't try to capitalize on his birth. So when he goes into some difficult things in the old, about the Old Testament and what our duties are as Christians, we need to approach this teaching as a loving message from God. Something that is written to all of us, not just a select group of us, not just to pastors or scholars or something, but deeply rooted, beloved feelings from God wanting us to do these things. We're being taught something from above. 
something from God himself. Jude called himself Jesus' slave. Who are we to think of any different? Did you know what Jesus liked to wear on Tuesdays? Did you know like what he, what he liked to dress like when he went to when he went to the to the uh, to the temple or when he went to the uh, to the to the to the gathering places for for the Saturday service? No, we don't know that. We don't know what his favorite food is. Jude did. You see, Scripture expects us to apply this level of humility, both understanding these good wishes for God and also doing what he's going to command us to do soon. Things that we struggle with, things that we're going to have a difficult time with, are here for us. These are commands for us. And we have to remember this in the very hard things it is to do. Hard things, uh, one of them we're going to be talking about is defending the faith. That's a hard thing to do. We're going to be called to defend the faith here and to present the gospel to others. Why is this hard? Well, it's hard for a lot of people to do that. It's hard for us to, to get the gumption up to speak and tell people that Jesus Christ died for their sins, that they individually are a sinner, and, but Jesus Christ died for them. I'm a sinner. You're a sinner. They need to understand they're sinners too, admit it, confess it before the Lord, and trust that Jesus' sacrifice covers them. Why? Because we don't want them to, to go through the eternity without having that gift. We don't want them not to know God's uh, peace, mercy, and love. We want them to know that because the, the alternative is knowing his wrath, his wrath, and think of how terrible that would be when he turns his eye to them and, say, and says, I never knew you. Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. Depart from me into that fiery pit over there where you just saw me throw Satan and the Antichrist. Go there. Wait in that fiery waiting place um, that, that Lazarus saw. Wait for me there for judgment. Instead of peace, mercy, and love, instead it's fiery wrath. And we have to be thinking about that as we present the gospel to others and learn to preach it to them. Well, this is the first part of Ephesians. Um, part two will be next time. But this time, let us think about this. Let us think about the, the man who could have claimed the title, who could have claimed an authority well beyond anybody else, but didn't, and chose to write us first about God's peace, mercy, and love toward us, that he wants that for us. And then he's going to instruct us in what God else God wants from us. Let's be thinking about that as we go through this text. Um, and remember that we should always pray before and after. Uh, let's pray now. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Lord, that you give us your word and that you show us what you would have us do, Lord. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, Soli Dio Gloria. Say you next time.